Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sarah Rosa Mortel, and I have the great honor to be the president of the Urban Institute and to get to say welcome and thank you for joining us for today's discussion of resilience in rural and native communities. Before I jump in, we're all used to this now, a few notes of housekeeping. We are recording the event and speaker bios are on the event webpage where you can learn more about who's on our panel. You will also find there the recording and relevant links posted online after the event. Live captions are on, but you can set your own preferences by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. All of the participants are muted, but please share your questions and thoughts into the Q&A box at any time. We'll be sharing a link with you to a post event survey, and we really appreciate if you share your feedback with us. It helps us and the panelists to hear what you're thinking about, and it shapes our events in the future. And I really encourage you to join the conversation on Twitter. So please use the hashtag live at urban and you can be part of the conversation with everyone else. All right, so one might ask, am I in the right place at the Urban Institute for a discussion of rural communities? But from Urban's founding in 1968, we've always been about people and their communities, the places where we can find barriers to opportunity or springboards to a better future. And that's why we are increasingly bringing our analytic capacity to focus on improving the well being of America's rural and native communities. Today's discussion reflects on one key piece of this growing body of work, and we're really pleased to have an amazing group of people here with us to talk about it. I don't need to tell you that in the past decade we've seen increasingly more powerful and more frequent natural disasters. Just last year, the US experienced 20 weather and climate related disasters that cost over a billion dollars each and together resulted in the deaths of 688 Americans. With changing climate, disasters such as drought, drought, wildfires and flooding are expected to only be more numerous. And since most of the land area in the United States is rural, it's no surprise that these communities are frequently hard hit. At the same time, these areas can be the least well resourced and so least well prepared. And as a result, we also see the longest recovery times, contributing to loss of homes and businesses, incomes and revenues, and the spirit of community. Given the increasing frequency of such devastation, it's really urgent that we explore how to build rural and native community resiliency and provide support to prepare, respond, and recover. We have a great group of guests today that come from the rural Midwest, South and West and our native lands. I trust they're gonna share a lot of their experiences of the impact of extreme weather events on rural and native people and places. And the evidence we have that these rural communities, particularly communities of color and those facing persistent poverty take disproportionately longer to recover from natural events. Most importantly, we hope that the conversation is gonna to start to showcase examples of success, of successful planning, response and recovery initiatives and highlight the policy and program choices that we can make to help rural communities get back on their feet more quickly when the seemingly unavoidable happens again. Before we get to the discussion, I wanna quickly thank the Interdisciplinary Research Leaders, which is a national leadership development program supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The Interdisciplinary Research Leaders Program is an opportunity for teams of researchers and community partners that working together use the power of applied research to inform and support work that's being done in communities. It's cases where the research can help accelerate finding solutions to advance health and equity. And thanks to this program, some folks will hear from today, Inez Polonius of Communities Unlimited, Allison Davis of the Community and Economic Development Initiative of Kentucky. She's also a professor at the University of Kentucky. And my colleague, Corianne Scali, have been together working for several years now on research connecting rural water and wastewater infrastructure to community health and economic development. And we're gonna hear a little bit about what they're learning and the work that's happening in today's discussion. But before we do that, I'd like to welcome Sochil Torres Small, the Undersecretary for Rural Development in the US Department of Agriculture. This is the second time we've had the honor of hosting the Undersecretary. The first time was last December for a discussion of supporting asset-based rural investment and capacity building. And you can find that video on our website as well. 
Before coming to rural development, Undersecretary Torres Small was the US representative for New Mexico's second congressional district, which is the fifth largest district in the country. And she was the first woman and first person of color to represent that district. The Undersecretary has been a longtime champion of rural communities. She's especially proud that in the midst of COVID crisis, she kept a rural hospital from closing its doors. She improved constituent access to healthcare over the phone and helped ensure, secure tens of millions of dollars for broadband in New Mexico through USDA's ReConnect program. Previously, she raised the alarm on broadband disparities for rural communities, serving on majority with James Clyburn's Rural Broadband Task Force. So Undersecretary, it is great to have you back at the Urban Institute. Thanks for being here. Sarah, thank you so much for having me again. It's uh, an honor as always to get to be uh, able to participate in, in the good work that you do at the Urban Institute. And uh, my team is just so deeply grateful. And I'm glad that Farah is gonna be able to participate as well today. Uh, deeply grateful for your partnership in this work. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me and thank you for hosting this important conversation. Uh, for those of you who work in the disaster space, you, uh, Perhaps what brings you back to do such difficult work is the people who you met the first disaster you experienced. And today I wanna to share some of the ways that USDA rural development shows up when a disaster strikes, uh, including how we help communities become more resilient before and after a disaster happens. But before going into that, I, I wanna share a few words about the first family I met uh, after their home had burned down from a wildfire and the, the way that first disaster experience uh, and their strength in responding to it inspires the work that, that I get to do and, and that we all do at Rural Development. I remember the, the worry and the fear that the parents shared about keeping their home safe and all of the little things they did to try to keep their kids as upbeat and positive as possible as they were moving from home to home in those early days immediately following the disaster. I was also struck by the unspeakable gratitude that they felt in spite of everything that had happened. They were grateful for their neighbors who showed up to do everything they could, even though that would never be enough to be with them in the midst of the heartache. I was inspired by their strength uh, in willingness to look for the silver linings and the willingness to uh, find solutions when they had lost so much. And in their, their taking on their conversations about the paperwork that was required to access recovery assistance long into the future. That paperwork is just so difficult, especially it's such a challenging personal time. And it's not something we talk about enough. It's not something we work on to address enough. I, I firmly believe that if government programs aren't accessible because of complicated forms, then we're not doing our jobs and we certainly need to do better. That's on us. People uh, need us to be there when, when disaster strikes and make sure that we truly are accessible. So I, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but first I just wanna give you a 30,000 foot view uh, of what rural development is and, and how we work with communities uh, when they've been hit by a disaster. First, when a disaster hits, uh, we likely will have properties in the area, whether it's uh, buildings that we've uh, provided loans to fund, whether it's a home or a community facility uh, or wastewater treatment systems that uh, serve the area or electricity that's provided uh, based on loans that we've provided. So we immediately contact individuals who've been funded, uh, either their homes or those other facilities through us and make sure they know that they don't need to worry about their loan payment, uh, that we can suspend it. And we also have a myriad of options to help with their payment in the future. We're also there to help with everything from home repairs uh, to tree and brush removal to emergency housing and help with rent. And with the rebuilding, so what happens in the wake of a disaster, how we rebuild, uh, both building or purchasing a new home, as well as those other systems we mentioned. We also work with FEMA uh, and state level disaster agencies to identify other places for those individuals and families to live in the immediate aftermath. In the case of wildfires, we can also work with utility specialists, rural electric co-ops to set up utility support and prevent additional fire risk uh, while continuing to fight the fire. 
as important as it is that we're there in the short term for those immediate urgent needs, we're also there for the long haul, supporting our state directors as they continue to help their community after a disaster. For example, by supporting repairs for schools and hospitals, replacements for equipment and vehicles, and repairs of water and wastewater systems. But we've learned that the way communities re rebuild depends a ton on what capacity is there in the first place. In this way, disasters have highlighted the already pressing and persistent need to invest in capacity. Think about it this way. Disasters are incredibly humanizing because no matter what community you live in or how many resources you have, when you lose your home, the suffering is tremendous. But the next question is, how long does it take for you to be able to rebuild? How long will you and your family be in that unsafe and uncertain situation? How long might you have to go without running water, without electricity, without a consistent roof over your head? That length and time to rebuild is a capacity issue. It's also an equity issue. The Biden-Harris administration is dedicated to reducing the suffering that impacts underserved communities who are disproportionately affected during disasters and that length of time for rebuilding. In fact, USDA just released an equity action plan that includes, among other things, an emphasis on partnering with trusted technical assistance providers, reducing barriers to USDA programs, and improving support to underserved farmers, ranchers, landowners, and farm workers, as well as people living in rural communities, and increasing USDA infrastructure investments that benefit underserved communities. All of these efforts address capacity because capacity increases resilience. And that's why we've taken action to prioritize investments in socially vulnerable communities. Think about how the social vulnerability index is calculated based on socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, minority status and language, housing and transportation, uh, average age, these factors perfectly illustrate how equity and capacity are tied together. That's why I'm proud that we have prioritized investment in, uh, in communities that are socially vulnerable and I'm excited to work to partner to better do that work together. Lastly, I, I can't leave this discussion without talking about climate change because extreme weather is impacting everyone in rural America. And it's irresponsible to talk about disasters without talking about fighting climate change too. Right now, I'm in Arizona, and whether I was talking with a Republican county commissioner or uh, a very progressive uh, healthcare center community, water is on everyone's minds because they know that it's tied to their future uh, in rural places and their economic vitality and the chance to invest and build. Uh, in, in some places here in, in Arizona, uh, you can't build until you can prove the sustainability of, of, of your water plan uh, because resources are stretched so thin right now. So as hard as we are working to make communities more resilient when disaster hits, that work is made harder every single year by climate change. More or bigger storms, more fires all year long. Uh, my, my home state of New Mexico right now has fires, not just during what, what I sometimes call the hot season, which is a lot of New Mexico, but in the windy season too. In fact, uh, there's fires raging right now. And when it's windy, those fires are dramatically more dangerous. So we've got to keep fighting climate change and to decrease the prevalence of those disasters. We're doing this through strategic energy investment. Our REAP program, for example, helps everyone, whether you're a farmer or a biofuels producer or a local grocery store. If you want to increase your operations efficiency or invest in renewable energy, we're glad and eager to partner with you. Also, it includes our participation in Justice 40, making sure that our investments in climate change are targeted to where people are most impacted. So in closing, I just deeply appreciate this opportunity to talk about rural development's role in helping communities recover in, from worst case scenarios, because we know that disasters are life-changing events for everyone, but their impact shouldn't be better or worse depending on your zip code.
So I look forward to working with all of you to make a more resilient, equitable future a reality for more communities across rural America. Thank you all so much for the important work you do. And thanks for being great partners. Well, thank you so very much, Undersecretary Torres Small, uh, for your remarks and your time today. Uh, we appreciate USDA rural development and, and your work, particularly supporting our rural places. We know you have a lot of things to do and, and to take the time today is very meaningful for all of us who work in this space. Uh, my name is Allison Davis. I am a professor of agricultural economics and a rural economic development extension specialist at the University of Kentucky. So my goal for the next few minutes is just to provide a bit of context for today's discussion. Next slide. So Sarah mentioned this in her opening remarks, but I think it's worth repeating. In just 2021, across the United States, there were 20 and weather climate disaster events, uh, many, many more than that, but those 20 uh, disaster events had losses exceeding $1 billion for each event. These events included one drought, two flooding events, 11 severe storms, four tropical cyclones, one wildfire, and one winter storm event. Overall, these events resulted in the death of 724 people and had significant economic effects on the areas impacted. The 1980 to 2021 annual average is 7.7 .7 events. However, over these last five years, there were 17.8 events on average. So this map provides an overview of where uh, these 20 huge disasters occurred. Next slide. So while these data on, on the map here, on the slide here, tend to lag a little bit in time, the map shown here uh, illustrate that disasters impact rural places. And many of those places are areas of high poverty. The, Bigger map highlights presidential disaster declarations from 2000 to 2015. The upper map um, provides an overview of where our rural uh, communities live um, based on the Rural Urban Continuum Code, which is a classification scheme that delineates metropolitan communities by the population of their metropolitan area and non-metropolitan counties by the degree of urbanization an adjacency to a metro area. Each area is assigned one of nine codes where one would be considered most urban and nine would be most rural. Now we know that disasters do not discriminate between rural and urban areas. However, the large map highlights the significant number of disasters along the Gulf Coast, in the Midwest, across the Delta and through parts of Appalachia. We also know that these areas tend to be more rural as the map highlights, and they tend to be more economically distressed. And as our undersecretary mentioned, impact socially disadvantaged communities. Next slide. The impact of a disaster and the community's ability to respond and rebuild will depend on the community's capacity to organize, prioritize, and garner resources. Now, Undersecretary Torres Small mentioned how essential capacity was for rebuilding. She said, and I quote, capacity increases resilience. So we came upon a great new uh, resource uh, through Headwaters Economics, and hopefully one of my colleagues today will talk a little bit more about that. But the idea here is to help identify communities with limited capacity to respond to disasters. And as such, Headwaters created a new rural capacity index. The capacity index is based on 10 variables that can function as proxies for community capacity. The variables incorporate metrics related to local government staffing, community engagement and education, and socioeconomic trends. For example, components of the Rural Capacity Index include the presence of an individual who oversees planning or zoning, the presence of a college or university, the number of households with a broadband subscription, as well as voter turnout, among six other measures. The index is available at the county, the county subdivision, and community scale. 
the tool displays data across the urban to rural continuum to illustrate the variability in community capacity across the country. The Midwest has the most limited capacity, followed by the Gulf Coast, the West, and the Southeast. Now note how these results are also consistent with the maps in the previous slide, where we saw that disasters occur in rural places where there are large pockets of poverty. The tool is designed to advocate for resources. It can also be used by federal and state agencies to more deliberately invest in communities that would otherwise be left behind, which is why we're here today. The index can be used to target infrastructure, investments, including transportation, education, and climate resilience projects. Next slide. While the previous slides focused on floods and wildfires, I will now get a bit more personal. My job is to serve the needs of rural communities in Kentucky. On December 10th of last year, a series of tornadoes ripped through the central and southern US. One of the tornadoes moved from across Western Kentucky and produced catastrophic damage to several towns, including Mayfield, Princeton, Dawson Springs, and Bremen. You'll see right here, this is a picture of Mayfield. And this is actually not the, the hardest hit part of the downtown. The tornado destroyed the University of Kentucky's experiment station and farm just at 18 months after its ribbon cutting. The tornado made national news, particularly when Mayfield Consumer Projects products a candle factory, one of the community's largest employers, was destroyed and dozens of workers lost their lives while working the third shift. There was so much devastation across multiple communities. While the University of Kentucky has the capacity and resources to rebuild and relatively quickly, these other communities were sent thousands of teddy bears from those with the best of intentions. However, what they really needed was a coordinated response to get them back in their feet and a roof over their head. Next slide. So this video is taken by me. Uh, please excuse the windshield wipers. Uh, this video is taken 60 days after the tornado. I can't stress that enough. This was not the next morning. This was two months after the tornado right outside downtown Mayfield. My purpose of going through these communities was to determine how my organization could help support the redevelopment of these small communities. Do we need to focus on downtown revitalization, downtown rebuilding, uh, new homes, uh, education? And it just became very clear that while we as an organization had the capacity to support rebuilding in these small communities, these communities are facing months and years of cleanup. And I just stopped and cried, kind of a little bit like right now, and felt utterly hopeless and helpless. Now, while this was a particularly tragic event for Kentucky, it's certainly not the only uh, isolated event disaster that occurred in the Commonwealth over the last year or two. This is not isolated across the country and deeply affects our rural communities. Next slide. The motivation for this webinar is a byproduct of work with my colleagues who you will hear from today, Dr. Corianne Scali and Ms. Uh, Ines Polonius, as we try to better understand how rural water systems can best prepare for extreme weather and climate disasters. The research explored two rural communities and their response to winter storm Uri in South Texas, a record-breaking deep freeze that occurred in February 2021 over 10 days. Nearly 12 million people, or 41% of all Texans, experience water service disruptions across 590 public water systems across 141 counties. As part of this research, we crafted a series of recommendations that were designed to improve both the water system's response to disaster, as well as improve service for residents the system supports. We expect that some of these recommendations will be discussed later with our panelists. Thank you. I'm now going to turn over to my colleague, Dr. Corey Scali, who will kick off our panel discussion and introduce our panelists. Thank you so much, Allison, um, for uh, that framing and the introduction. I'm going to invite our panelists to turn on their cameras.
Um, hi everyone, I'm Corianne Scally. I'm a senior fellow at the Urban Institute and have had the privilege of being part of the Interdisciplinary Research Leader Program along with Allison um, and Ines, who I will introduce shortly. And we're just really thrilled to be joined by a panel with such deep expertise um, to discuss how to build greater resiliency um, to disasters in our rural and native communities. Uh, Farah Ahmad is Chief of Staff for USDA Rural Development. She brings extensive experience with rural community and economic development, as well as with financial resiliency. Kimmy Barrett is Senior Wildfire Research and Policy Analyst at Headwaters Economics and a native Montanan. Her work is focused on community-driven solutions to reduce wildfire risk and increase community resiliency. Nikki Cooley is co-manager of the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals Tribal Climate Change Program at Northern Arizona University. She is of the Diné Nation by way of Shanto and Blue Gap, Arizona. And finally, my colleague Ines Polonius, who is Chief Executive Officer at Communities Unlimited, a community development financial institution serving rural communities in the Southern United States, including assistance and capital to rural water and wastewater systems. Um, we're really thrilled to have you all and look forward to an engaging discussion. And I'll remind our audience that you're welcome to enter in any questions you have for any or all of our panelists in the Q&A box um, during the panel, and we will be circling back um, and getting some answers to those for you in the last part of our webinar. So from the wonderful comments we've heard already um, from the Undersecretary's experience and discussion um, of uh, what rural development is doing um, to Allison's important framing, we certainly know that different regions are susceptible to specific types of weather. And we also know that extreme weather events um, from heat waves to deep freezes and floods and climate related extreme events like drought and wildfires are occurring more frequently. So this conversation today is both timely and urgent. Um, so Farah, I'd like to start with you and ask from your vantage point um, at USDA Rural Development, what kind of effects have you seen on rural America in terms of these types of disasters and what ongoing conversations are you engaged in um, on how to build greater rural and native resiliency? I know the Undersecretary mentioned some, uh, some undertakings and maybe you'd care to expand and add Absolutely. Well, first, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for the invitation to be here today. Uh, it's always nice to be joined um, by colleagues and by friends who have a shared purpose and vision, especially around supporting rural and tribal communities. Um, as the Undersecretary mentioned, um, USDA rural development um, you know, plays a, a critical role in terms of disaster re resiliency. And this administration in particular has a really dedicated uh, sense of urgency and commitment to building um, back better in rural and tribal communities um, who have been affected by disasters, but also on the front end as well in terms of helping communities become more disaster resilient. Um, and a large part of that is around strengthening infrastructure. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. But first I wanna kind of set the stage a little bit about rural development's role um, in sort of the, um, you know, resiliency space and all the way through the, the recovery space. So rural development at USDA is often thought of as being really, you know, long-term oriented. And we know that's important um, because when, when communities want to rebuild, we want to make sure that there is a long-term view about making their infrastructure stronger and sustainable and more resilient. We know that strong infrastructure is oftentimes the best defense um, against climate events. Um, but I think in addition to that, one thing that USC rural development brings to the table is some of our local relationships. So I know I've seen in my experience um, doing community development work around the country that oftentimes, you know, FEMA is one of the first uh, uh, you know, agencies on the scene, usually the first agency, but USDA is, is there oftentimes um, second because we're already present 
uh, in those spaces. Our staff is uh, field based and they live and, and work in the communities, the rural and native communities that we serve. And they bring a lot of local relationships that I think are really crucial to success and making sure that communities stay together during these difficult times um, as they're you know, recovering from disasters. Um, another thing that I, I wanna mention in terms of what are, you need, the question you asked, what are the ongoing conversations about how to continue to build rural resiliency? Some of it is just about how we as you know, the federal government partner with communities in better and more strategic ways. And one of those uh, that we've been trying to do over the last year and a half in this administration is really focusing on how can we prioritize our investments in areas that we know are susceptible to climate events and really give a, you know, a climate resiliency priority to our investments. So we've launched a couple of efforts to do that. Um, some are really using all of the great data and resources that are out there um, to really determine what are those areas that are physically vulnerable, socially vulnerable when it comes to um, uh, you know, climate events, and then looking at how we can strategically invest in those places to strengthen their infrastructure and the resilience of their infrastructure. So that's just one of the ways that I, I've been engaged in recently about how to build rural resiliency to disasters. And the last thing that I'll mention uh, is really around um, you know, planning support, disaster support, and individual support. Um, so the first is, you know, we are always trying to work with communities to look ahead um, and you know, help develop community plans in partnership with communities, looking at their infrastructure, seeing where they have risks. And you know, oftentimes planning ahead can mean slightly more expensive infrastructure. Um, but that's where we really want to be a partner. You know, for example, um, a higher flood levy may ne need to be built if a community is thinking more long term about resilient infrastructure. But we want to be there as a partner to help finance that. Um, another thing that we, you know, are always looking to engage, you know, cities and counties in, is what uh, infrastructure do they need to have immediate disaster response supports in place? So if that's you know shelters for heating and cooling centers, if that's mobile co communication equipment or first responder equipment, those are all kinds of things that we wanna help fund to have communities be ready and resilient. And the last thing um, which the undersecretary mentioned a little bit of is really individual support that we can provide whether that's um, on home repairs or improvements to ensure that homes are safe and sound prior to any disaster. Um, those are the kinds of investments that we're looking to make in rural and tribal communities to really meet communities where they are and support them in their uh, resiliency efforts. Wonderful, thank you for that great overview of um, so many topics we hope to cover with um, all panelists today uh, from preparation through recovery. Um, so I'd like to focus on preparation um, with the rest of you as well. Um, obviously, uh, preparation seems like a really important steps for communities to take, um, but it often gets underemphasized with existing policies and resources. As Farah mentioned, sometimes it you know, takes a larger investment upfront that can be difficult to make happen sometimes. Um, I'd like to ask uh, our other panelists, why and how does disaster preparation matter for the rural and native communities that you work with? Um, and what, in your experience, does good preparation look like? Um, and Nikki, I'd love to start with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Yet a Kenya Ani Nishlan look at the Nebashin, is a Sana Eda Shanale, Hoahed Lini Eda Shiche, a cut out a Dene, a son in Nishle. I introduce myself to you in the Navajo way. I am of the Towering House clan, born for the Reed people. Maternal grandparents are of the many or water that flows together. Paternal grandparents are of the many goats clan. So I am sharing my culture with you, but also as a sign of respect to all our relatives, including the non-human ones. Um, so I, that's 
big part of how indigenous people care for the land and care for themselves. Um, and I'm going to frame this question in that context because that's a large part of my work and I, a large part of what I believe all the institutions um, around disaster recovery and preparation should also keep in mind. Culture, language um, is a big part of that. I mean, our, for Indigenous people, our livelihoods are, you know, spiritual, physical, um, emotional, are innately tied to the environment. Um, and that's how we maintain our identity. So if a part of that is lost, whether that um, the fire has completely incinerated um, a part of the forest or the land where our traditional foods were growing or foraging, then we lose a part of ourselves. Um, there's a piece missing uh, from that puzzle. And disaster prep is so important in that context because um, for a lot of our communities, uh, they're rural, they lack the key infrastructure uh, so, uh, services to respond um, or people can, uh, people can have access to them. Um, as Undersecretary uh, said, we cannot ignore climate change, um, it's increasing. Um, and so you asked the question uh, about what does good preparation look like? Keep in mind of that, keep in mind that culture. Uh, it's, it's, it's in and out, there's, uh, you know, ways of doing and ways of not doing when you go into a community, especially if you're working um, outside that community uh, and, you know, respect and upholding tribal sovereignty and self-determination because, you know, tribal nations, well, at least for the federally recognized tribes, the 574 tribes, uh, we uh, um, self-govern ourselves, we're sovereign nations and keep that in mind. Um, and it, that's also can be very complex, but keeping that in mind um, shows that respect that you have for that community. But also, as I mentioned, culture and language, I keep saying that it's, uh, you're in, if you recognize that you're integrating the holistic response that are very much in line with tribal values and that could be very beneficial in getting uh, things done or moving uh, things along um, faster. Um, another reason why disaster prep um, matters is because we have to keep in mind that 25% of all tribal nations um, have an office of emergency management. And less than 10% of those offices have staff, managers, capacity, um, as uh, the previous speakers were saying, capacity is so important. Um, so without these specific management programs that respond to disasters, uh, emergencies, it's challenging to even work um, and implement uh, recovery efforts, um, even though you're getting assistance from uh, non-Indigenous um, agencies, communities, and organizations, and whatnot. So it, uh, that, that, that makes it uh, challenging, but also keeping that in mind um, when you're going into these communities, it's, that, that's really, really important. Um, so with that, I think I'll pass it back over to you. So I just kind of want to mention that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, for that perspective. Kimmy, would you like to um, chime in based on um, the great work that you do with communities around wildfire preparation? Yeah. Um, again, echoing all the other panelists, this is a great honor to be part of this conversation. So thank you for the invitation and bringing attention to this very, very valuable topic that has come into light so increasingly so with climate change and other uh, challenges we're facing. So yes, my name is Kimmy Bear. I uh, specialize in wildfire and community planning and preparedness. So much of the comments I'm, I'm about to speak to draw from that insight. Um, and, and so with that in mind, I want to first state that wildfire, unlike a lot of other natural disasters out there, is actually um, a, an ecological necessity. It's something native populations for millennia have known and incorporated into their agricultural practices and their livelihood and way of coexisting with wildfire. And that's something, unfortunately, that we have lost 
um, as, as we developed and as a Western society. And so a big piece, first and foremost, is integrating some of that traditional ecological knowledge into how we are managing and understanding wildfires, knowing that they provide enormous benefits to ecosystem rejuvenation. Having said that, obviously, when homes are placed in harm's way, communities are threatened and people are immediately impacted. And we know that those impacts are differentially experienced and that longstanding institutional, cultural, economic, and political barriers greatly influence the ability to prepare for, respond to, and recover from a wildfire. So it, it's hard, right? Because we, we need wildfire on the landscape and yet at the same time, they do pose a direct and immediate threat to communities and livelihoods. For a very long time, when we think about preparation, our natural response, both at a federal level as well as a state and local level has been to control wildfires as they behave and manifest on the landscape. It's the only natural hazard out there that we actually place people in harm's way to protect a home. We would never ever do that with a hurricane or a flood or sea level rise and put somebody else in harm's way to protect our structures. And yet we do this with wildfire. So a big piece of the preparation increasingly being called for with climate change is that we actually fundamentally shift how we're perceiving wildfires and think much more ahead of time to anticipate that inevitability. So planning our communities with building materials, community design methods, fuel reduction efforts around the community itself to actually anticipate that wildfire occurrence so that we can have long-term resiliency and the ability to thrive following that wildfire event. So what does that mean for rural communities? Well, it means that we have to tailor and customize those responses, those policy solutions to be commensurate with the impacts that are locally felt. And that comes in the form of technical assistance and enhancing capacity as we've heard from so many other panelists so far. And really being able to understand what are those local impacts as they manifest on the ground and what are the best solutions to address and mitigate that risk. And we do have the answers to be able to do this better. We just need to start more actively incorporating it into how we're managing and anticipating wildfires. Wonderful. Ines, would you like to, to add? Um, I, I saw you nodding that resonated with your work as well. Absolutely. And, and first of all, I want to say a, a big thank you, Corianne, to you and to Allison for your partnership in the Interdisciplinary Leadership Program um, and being able to invite Nikki and, and um, Kimmy and Farah to this conversation with us. So we are um, at Communities Unlimited, both a rural development hub and a CDFI. We're actually the Southern RCAP, part of the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, which means that a lot of our work focuses on rural water and wastewater. And more and more in the last uh, decade, really, we've been engaged in disaster response to, to really focus on the role of water systems and wastewater systems because a lot of times they get forgotten. The pipes are underground, right? And, and we don't really focus on them. And yet for response and recovering, a functioning water system is so critical. Um, and also looking at the, the health impact. Every time that um, a boil order is issued for a water system because of some kind of an intrusion, the risk that the consumer doesn't do the right thing and therefore um, there may be a spread of, of waterborne illnesses is, is much higher. So um, part of what, what Allison referenced earlier was the case study that the three of us worked on and, and particularly with the, the Urban Institute team um, and looked at two systems in South Texas. One is Mirando City serving about 500 people and El Oso serving about 6,000 people. Um, and looking at how these two systems responded um, and were prepared for record-breaking deep freeze, which, you know, in South Texas is not something uh, that they are used to, um, that, that really, at the same time, they were also suffering a loss of electricity. So we've learned a lot through this case study, and I know that the case study link has been posted in the chat, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, I'm certainly not going to go through all of the recommendations, but, you know, Corianne, when it comes to preparation, there are really two things that we learned uh, first and foremost. One is the importance of the emergency response plan, that now every small water system, every rural water system has to have in place. Um, this is required if you're going to borrow money from USDA, uh, but it's also required by the primacy agencies in each of the states. 
um, that look at, at keeping these systems in compliance. But again, here's where capacity building comes in, right, is, is helping the, the board and helping the water operator step through uh, the planning process and, and really planning for all eventualities, upgrading systems, upgrading pipes um, on the front end, uh, in addition to having the response plan in place if, if an emergency does happen. Um, the second piece that was really clear in this example is the need to invest in sufficient generator capacity. One system didn't have a generator, the other system had a generator, but really couldn't um, sustain over this long period of time. And when push came to shove in the middle of the disaster, it was there were just no generators available. And then if they, they tried to order them outside of the state, they had to pay up front the full amount of the generator, which for a very small rural water system is particularly challenging uh, because there's so few reserves in place. So, so these are all pieces of that preparation and that resilience which, which becomes so important. And again, more recommendations in the case study, but I think those are the two, uh, Corian, that really stuck out um, for us to, to always be mindful of as we're working with water systems. Absolutely. Um, I uh, see how everything runs together. Um, the preparation, the response, the recovery um, are so intertwined. Um, I'd like to focus in a bit more on the response and some of the themes that you've all raised, um, uh, as well as the undersecretary around um, capacity as really being a key, um, not just to prepare adequately, but also to know how to respond. So I'd love to hear where you've observed successful response um, within rural and native communities uh, when disaster strikes, um, and maybe where you've seen it fall short, and what do you think um, makes the difference between um, success and failure in these cases? And Kimmy, I'd love to, to hear your take um, from the uh, wildfires perspective. Yeah, so I think similar to a lot of other wild, you know, or disasters and in the course of this conversation, there's an arc with respect to wildfires. There's the planning, prevention, mitigation piece. There's the actual operational response, tactical, you know, this is firefighter suppression with respect to wildfires. And then there's the recovery and rebuilding. So within this arc, really the effectiveness of any one of those phases is really predicated on the effectiveness of the preceding phase. So response is only in so much going to be effective as the planning and the mitigation piece was prior to it. So it's really important to think about that within the context of, you know, the disproportionate impacts of wildfires and particularly those on rural and native communities. And so, you know, unfortunately, teasing out those successful response stories is, is few and far between much more what we're seeing now is with the recovery and the rebuilding process. And this is some, you know, there's some great flagship examples out there where this is done well. But, you know, I'm, I'm saying all of this within the context of wildfire because trying to access some of those early planning and prevention tools and resources is limited to rural and native communities to start with. So how well is their response really going to be if they don't have access to those first initial steps to start with? You know, you look at the BRIC grant program, for example, 94% of that funding went to coastal states that had higher capacity, had grant writers on staff, had engineers on staff, and had the time to actually apply for that program. A lot of rural and intermountain communities, interwestern communities, were not eligible for BRIC because they have planners that have multiple hats and are also the sanitarian at the same, same time as they're supposed to be the grant writer. So some of, you know, addressing some of those existing inequities is crucial. Similarly, the tool that Allison featured earlier that was indicating rural capacity indexes, um, you know, from a quick read of that, we identified that 96% of indigenous communities in the continental US rank below the national median when it comes to staffing and expertise needed to submit and comply with some of those federal grant funds. So that's an incredibly limiting barrier. So trying to address response is only going to work if we first address planning and preparation. Um, so 
I, I'm going to, you know, I, I want to kind of contextualize it with that first and foremost, but I don't want to leave on such a buzzkill either. And so what I would indicate is that, you know, there's the story of Malden, Washington. This is a rural capacity, you know, rural community has very limited capacity. It's out of Washington. It was devastated by the Bab Fire of 2020, uh, in which 80% of the town was devastated by a wildfire. 40% of the homeowners there did not have homeowners insurance and were displaced by it. Uh, and within two and a half hours, the entire community was more or less damaged or destroyed. But in the recovery rebuilding process, a lot of those themes that are not captured by metrics or indices really came to light. And that's things like social cohesion, sense of place, um, community attachment. And now over that course of rebuilding, the communities really come together. They, you know, in the form of faith leaders and other nonprofits, public private partnerships have come together to pull resources, apply for grants, expand their jurisdictional boundaries so that they can be part of the county and to really think deliberately and intentionally about a future wildfire event. How can they be better prepared knowing what they've learned from this past event to be better adapted and anticipate this wildfire that could happen again, well, very likely will happen again because it's a wildfire, but just so that they have learned the, you know, what lessons they can incorporate into future planning and design. Uh, and so there are opportunities to really insert and invest in upfront community mitigation. We just have to be willing to spend that time with some of that initial, you know, front loading effort so that we can see those long-term benefits really materialize and come to light following a wildfire. Nikki, I, I feel Kimmy has set you up wonderfully for a follow on there. She has, and I, I, I completely agree with everything she said, because all of that really does, really does apply to tribal communities. As someone who comes from two rural communities that we just got running water and electricity within the past uh, five years at my parents' um, homestead, and if I just got that um, access to that um, resource, then what does that say about the rest of, you know, the rural communities um, across the nation on tribal lands? Um, at, where there's a lot going through the same um, impacts um, or they're lacking a lot of those resources. That's just a little tiny piece of it. Um, but I just want to uh, add to what Kimmy said by saying that the successes that we see um, are few and far between. I mean, some success, success, excuse me, successes that I could mention is that tribal nations are really moving towards establishing emergency management departments and dedicate and and de finding dedicated staff. Um, as she was saying, um, it's so true that our nations have very, um, you know, people have wear the same hat. You know, we have very little capacity. I know many coordinators who are climate coordinators, the bus driver, and they also are the school crossing guard. You know, that's just one example. But I think uh, she hit it real on on the she hit it home when she said that the success is really in the recovery, except uh, instead of the response. Community grassroots organizations working to support or complement the efforts of tribal leadership, tribal governments and their efforts has been key. COVID was a great example. There's many, um, in the past two years, there's many um, organizations, but one in particular, the Navajo Hopi COVID Relief uh, Fund headed by uh, Ethel Branch uh, was founded by a group of Navajo women and using their own funds and then eventually getting uh, foundations and donations and that those kinds of funds to support their efforts. And they work to complement what the Navajo Nation, the Hopi leadership were, were doing. Um, and I just want to mention too that about some of the, um, I guess, where it falls short. Tribes do not have approved disaster plans, maybe around 30% do. And without these FEMA approved plans, that makes tribes ineligible to receive funding, to be eligible, even to receive reimbursement, you know? So that that's a big barrier right there. And also tribes receive less than half of what, um, uh, non-tribal nation citizens uh, receive. So U.S. citizens receive 
Uh, this could have changed, but in the last time I checked, it was like $26 per person per year. These are uh, across the board US citizens, whereas tribal nation citizens receive $3 um per person per year um so we're and then we're competing for minimal disaster aid fund um so there's many barriers um and uh you know i'm, I'm hoping that the next time we come around we can be uh bragging more about the successes and what works but investing up front and and accepting the fact that that can take a long time um is something that all of us need to do so, and, and back to you. Thank you. Ines, I'd love to, to hear your um, thoughts and examples around successful response and recovery versus at times when you've, you've seen it not go so well. Um, and then I'd also love to just circle back um, and hear a little bit more from each of you about the different capacity building models that you that you do try and use effectively with your communities to make sure we um, glean that real those useful um, capacity building stories from you as well. Corianne, I'm, I want to build on on what Kimmy said, um, but also Nikki's comments. Um, you know, rural communities do get left behind in disaster response, especially if an urban area was impacted. And so, you know, if you look at the impact of this, and I, and I think the undersecretary said it so well, um, but when the, the community doesn't see a response, then folks leave the community. And once they've gotten their family settled, they have a new home, or they're renting a place, they found a new school, they found a new job, they're not coming back. And that I think is the biggest risk to rural places is that we then lose more population, which you know so much of rural America is, is struggling with that already. Um, and so what, what we've seen um, really make a difference, and we saw it with a different kind of disaster called COVID, was you know, we, we build local leadership teams and communities that invite us in. And the places that had local leadership teams, they had a much stronger and better response to COVID than those communities that weren't organized in that way, where everybody was just looking to one mayor who had their hands full um, to solve all the problems. Um, and so I think that, that for us was a lesson learned that this is also part of that resilience equation. But the, the truth is that the response arc is so slow for rural. And I want to give you a, two really concrete examples. We've been working with communities that were impacted by Hurricane Ike back in 2008. Many of those communities did not receive FEMA funding until 2018. So then when Hurricane Harvey hit in 2017, there was about a, a billion dollars allocated to response and recovery. So we're in these communities, working with them from response to recovery, they have yet to see their FEMA payment. And, and that's really where, where some of the struggle comes in that I think Nikki also referenced in terms of what native um, uh, and, and tribal lands deal with. And so I wanna speak a little bit to um, this being a team effort, right? I think the undersecretary and Farah spoke so eloquently about the response from USDA, and yet, to my knowledge, USDA is not part of the FEMA interagency response team. There are six federal agencies, a number of state agencies and nonprofits that are part of that, um, but USDA does not have an allocated uh, piece of the pie when it comes to a disaster, and yet they have such a strong response strategy, they have people on the ground, and so I think that's, that's something that I think from a policy perspective we really need to look at. When it comes to recovery, I also want to speak to my colleagues that, that are out there um, listening to this or listening later that are in the CDFI industry. I think the CDFIs really, community development financial institutions, really set the mark during COVID. We know how to respond. And I think it's up to us now to really look at our work and figure out what our role is in climate disasters as well. So after Hurricane Harvey, we stepped out there and we made a loan for $900,000 and another loan for $650,000 within a couple of weeks of the disaster to keep a water system going, to keep a wastewater system going. After Winter Storm Uri, the, the, the disaster that we looked at in the case study, if you might remember, we had the, the payroll protection program as part of COVID relief. And so we 
contacted all of those systems that were impacted, figured out which ones were the nonprofits, and we made them PPP loans just to help them through that period um, that, that they were struggling through because of the winter storms. And again, it was just creatively looking at resources and, and trying to solve problems in that response phase so that we can get to recovery faster. Um, so, so I hope that's sort of a, a helpful look at what, what we think is, is required. We can't only look at FEMA. We need the other agencies, we need nonprofits, we need CDFIs to, to help in this sphere as, we, as we're facing more and more disasters. I'd love to give Farah a chance to, um, to respond uh, to the comments and then also um, circle back with Nikki and Kimmy in terms of uh, capacity building strategies that they found to be successful. Absolutely. And um, Inez is, is right. We, we are not a part of that interagency strategy, but we do play you know, a critical role in helping move communities um, with financing um, throughout the recovery process. I loved what Kimmy said earlier about the building blocks, about how every building block along this resiliency road is dependent on the one prior. Um, and I want to give just two quick examples of, you know, how I think uh, we as the federal government can um, be better at federal coordination in support of communities and their recovery work um, that I think can kind of speak to, you know, some of the, the challenges, but also the opportunities. Um, so, you know, USDA, like I, I mentioned, we, we really focus oftentimes on a orientation around long-term recovery and sustainability. But we have the ability, um, when we are partnered on the ground, to work with, with FEMA during the response efforts to really build towards that. So two examples um, come to mind. Um, one uh, was in Louisiana um, when they were recovering from Hurricane Laura back in, I think, the summer of 2020, when our rural development staff uh, in the field actually coordinated with FEMA staff uh, who were also on the ground to identify projects that FEMA could not fund uh, immediately as part of the response, but that needed funding long term, whether that was for equipment, for rehabilitation of buildings, or even new construction. And so we actually partnered with FEMA together. And what came out of that partnership was um, an identification of, I think, 300 or so a water and wastewater um, and community facilities projects that actually needed to get off the ground during the recovery phase, but were identified as part of the, the response phase. And I think that's a really good example of good government when it works, but also speaks to the need of federal, federal coordination um, because that isn't mandated, but just something that we are trying to do together to be good partners in service of communities. Um, the second example that kind of comes to mind about how, you know, we as federal government can, um, you know, strengthen our partnerships in service of communities is really around matching funds. So, you know, we all have these federal resources across uh, all of government that support rural and tribal communities. I think it's over 200 programs um, dedicated to, to rural communities, but they're all across, you know, dozens of different agencies. And that's really hard to navigate just in general, let alone when you're thinking about recovering from a disaster or a climate event. And so I think we can do a better job at working with communities and kind of connecting some of those dots together. Um, for example, you know, we know that FEMA has, you know, public assistance projects that they can fund, but they oftentimes have a matching requirement. But USDA Rural Development has financing that act can actually help meet that match um, and reduce outstanding debt for a community. So those are just two examples of how I think, you know, we uh, can work together. We have shown we can do it, but we really need to strengthen our partnerships in order to better serve communities as they're thinking through how they want to design their recovery efforts. Thank you. Um, Nikki and Kimmy, I'd love to uh, continue the conversation around the importance of building capacity, um, the wonderfully important themes around social cohesion and community building that you've mentioned and 
uh, some of your earlier responses. Can you talk more about the work that you do and how you try to contribute to fostering those environments in with the people and communities that you work with, particularly around response and recovery efforts? Sure, uh, Kimi, do you, I, don't, you, I hope you don't mind I go first. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, in my work, I do a lot of um, trainings, workshops, kind of like that. And a convener, connector. Uh, we work with all, all agencies, all, and anyone who wants to partner and help tribes and other communities uh, be prepared for climate change. Um, and one of the themes that overriding themes of our conversations um, in in, in terms of emergency response comes down to capacity. We've mentioned that quite a bit. And it's very, it's, it's a very well-known fact that for indigenous uh, communities, uh, we are sorely understaffed, under-resourced. Um, I'm not saying all tribes are, but most of us are. And we need specific invent investments in hiring coordinators that receive adequate and ongoing training um, and support, uh, staff support, that they have that staff support. So they're not working for jobs uh, for one department. And also providing that support for staff well being, because, you know, dealing with disaster prep response and recovery can be daunting and we don't want burnout. So that's kind of one of the, one of the things that our, our tribal partners have been bringing up. And so how do we how do we put that into the equation? And for years now, well, years, uh, the, as long as I have been with ITEP, it's about six years now, but um, and ITEP has been around for about 30 years. We have always been encouraging our federal partners for that investment. And it's not until this year, right, the Biden administration is putting a lot of money into um, tribal nations. Um, they just released uh, $46 million for, to address climate change in tribal communities um, and whatnot. And so we've been working with our partners um, on how exactly to do that. And I don't have one, one answer, you know, one answer is not gonna uh, cover all of our, what our tribal uh, communities and partners need, but it's a start. And so, and I'll end with this, that our institute has, our climate program has been working with these long, uh, like year long cohorts. And we just finished one uh, last year, uh, early summer about, uh, that was focused on tribal hazard mitigation planning, where we had over 70 tribal representatives that worked with BIA, FEMA, and um, other community partners on completing hazard mitigation plans, disaster plans, so they could access funds later on down the road. And so in that way, we're helping build that capacity and we're being that support system for tribes because that's what they've asked us for. A lot of them feel siloed, they feel alone. And so we're connecting them not only with our staff but with other tribal partners and non-tribal partners that can help them in this journey into becoming a prepared community when it comes to disasters. And I'll say as of right now, about 10 miles down the road, Road, there's a fire so we're we're on alert right now it's very windy here in northern Arizona and my my pulse is beating right now so imagine that you know times a million for communities that are repeatedly impacted by um, any type of disaster so it's really really important um, that we address this sooner than later and with that I can pass it over to Kimmy thank you um well, thank you, Nikki, for continuing your participation in this panel, um, given a wildfire alert. Um, I think what I have to say is gonna probably build off quite well with what uh, Inez and, and Nikki just said. I think when you're talking about enhancing rural capacity uh, for both rural communities as well as native communities, it has to happen on, on two fronts. At the community scale, the way with which we continually advocate for and approach our work 
is that it, it happens in three different parts. One is identifying where is our efforts best utilized and wildfire risk can actually be well mapped and identified with respect to those communities most threatened or most vulnerable. So once you identify that, number two, first and foremost, listen to the community. <laughs> they will understand those risks how those impacts are going to materialize at the community scale to impact them most. And then third, from that, how do we adapt our toolkit, our resources, the quiver with what we can bring and dispose within that community to be most effective to meet those local site-specific impacts. And part of that, first and foremost, really is listening to a community and hearing what they have to say, you know, as an outside external researcher, I can draw from my academic background, my experience, and it's nothing compared to the complete repository of knowledge and expertise that local communities bring. So I think that's really important. That's one piece of it. At the opposite end, on the other level of trying to understand and navigate this better is the federal perspective. And there's a couple concrete steps that need to start happening that are being proposed within the infrastructure bill and other wildfire provisions First and foremost is investing in a community, have some faith, have some trust in them that they can make some decision making around how to mitigate risk, but to do so they actually need money and they need support and technical assistance to do this. Increasing and leveraging existing partnerships, Inez, you said this so well, that is critical, you know, really utilizing and capitalizing on those local partnerships with community members that have an organized structure behind it can yield great outcomes and successes. Um, additionally to that, improving interagency coordination. I mean, we've all spoken about that on this panel. I think that's absolutely crucial. The silos make it really hard to understand where is that coordination happening. So trying to remove some of those barriers, improving access to block and competitive grants and eliminating match requirements. I think that's been said here multiple times as well. And then really fun technical assistance for project implementation, grant writing purposes, monitoring, maintenance, all of these little pieces, rural communities, sometimes they don't need much to just get over that threshold and they can do great and outstanding things with just a little bit of help, but they need some, some faith <laughs> and some backing from some of those support mechanisms at the federal level to be able to actually carry through and exercise some of that. Well, that's a great transition to our very last um, question for the panel before we turn to some great audience questions coming in. Um, you all have already talked about maybe some changes you'd like to see, but I'd like to put you on the spot to just summarize in just one to two sentences. What do you see as the most significant change um, from local practices up to national coordination policies and resources that you think would build greater rural and native community resilience to disasters. And I'm just gonna go down the line here and start with Ines. Two sentences. I wanna focus on the unique opportunity that we have right now. We've got $7.4 billion in federal funding flowing to state revolving loan funds, specifically for water and wastewater systems. But then we also have other infrastructure funding through the Infrastructure Improvement and Jobs Act that was signed last November. This really requires us to focus with intentionality on disaster preparedness and resilience. I mean, we have this unique window, which is why this conversation today is so critical, and we have to hold our state and federal partners accountable to that. Um, but I think, as Kimmy has said so well, we need that local capacity to help drive that, right? Um, and, and all those pieces need to come together, but I think the funding for the first time could be there if, if we know how to access it. Kimmy. Yeah, um, I'm going to just dovetail exactly what I now says. I think first and foremost, I'll say it again, invest in communities. <laughs> These risks are not going away. We need to learn to start coexisting. And again, this was with respect to wildfire. I would never say you need to coexist with a hurricane. With wildfire, it's different. We know that that risk is not going away. We need to start preparing our communities, our homes, our neighborhoods to better withstand and prepare and anticipate that wildfire before it occurs. And that fundamentally requires upfront investment for long-term benefits. Farah. I feel like we're all singing from the same sheet of music here. Um, I wanna echo uh, two things that I think would be my priority. One, as Inez mentioned, there's an unprecedented amount of funding right now 
um, for uh, rural and tribal communities. In fact, just um, last week, the White House launched a rural playbook, which is actually focused on all of the opportunities in the infrastructure bill, specifically for rural communities, some with set-asides or special program designs. And it really even highlights where do they have flexibilities in cost sharing and match requirement waiving. So I think this is such a great opportunity for communities to take advantage of those funds that are not only out there, but out there specifically for rural and tribal places. And the second is, uh, you know, I'd love to see uh, us as a federal family coordinate better in terms of putting uh, our funds towards strengthening local and regional partners, which we know are the greatest assets that we have and making sure that federal funds get to where they need to go and have the biggest impact. Nikki. Yes, um, respecting and upholding uh, tribal sovereignty, self-determination, while also integrating the holistic responses that uh, hold uh, true to the tribal values of the communities you're working with. Um, do, doing those two things, those are the key messages, by the way, in the Status of Tribes and Climate Change Report. So if it sounds familiar, that's where it's from. Uh, but it's an overriding theme in my li life anyway. But all th those two, two things are needed uh, uh, while um, recommending that we increase resources and support um, at the state and federal levels uh, to develop and support tribal emergency management programs, but also to increase um, interagency or just coordination with tribal nations to respond to disaster and climate hazards. So um, I think in a nutshell, that's what I would say. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, for this really great exchange. We'd love to um, turn our attention now to some great questions that have been posed by the audience uh, for you all to answer. And I'd like to start with one um, that asks, what are some of the best practices to help low capacity communities put forward transformational projects for federal funding, such as the BRIC um, program that Kimmy mentioned earlier. Um, there's a desire from the audience to hear a bit more about um, project level capacity building um, uh, to kind of have a little bit more nuance from some of the general capacity building initiatives that we've discussed. Would somebody like to talk about that? I, I can get the ball rolling and then uh, folks can build on that. For us, what's so critical is getting together a diverse leadership team of committed community folks. Some of them have never led before and, and getting them to really uh, prioritize, not create a big strategic plan that ends up on the shelf, but prioritize what's important for resilience, what's important to move that community toward prosperity. Most of the places where we work are in persistent poverty counties. And, and so, so folks have never been asked before what they think they need. Um, it, it also gives us an opportunity to work across all the other things that divide us, right? Um, race, ethnicity, age, gender, and, and really trying to figure out how, how do you create diversity on a team so that you've got all the voices at the table. Then the critical part is how do you then connect those initiatives to funding? And I think, again, we're in this unique space right now to work on that. And, and it is challenging it, to really help those folks then write a federal grant it's, because it's daunting. Um, and I think that's the piece that we're trying to figure out right now. Um, some communities have a little bit of capacity, others com other communities do not. And how do we fill that gap? I'll just add one thing from the, the federal side. Um, and Inez touched on this a little bit, which is uh, communities working together. I think when federal agencies oftentimes look at applications that come for grant or loan funding, they're looking where um, they're leveraging uh, expertise and resources across a region and not necessarily just in one community because it does extend the impact um, and viability and sustainability of projects. So I think there's 
you know, and I said having diverse leaders that that is so critical and especially from across the region that can work well with one another. Another question, a comment and question from the audience, uh, many rural areas have a greater need for pre-development and pre-planning support um, versus recovery support, which we've also emphasized, um, making the point that just identifying risks and needs can be costly. Um, is this type of assistance available and who can guide and advise communities um, through accessing these resources to plan appropriately? I can speak exclusively to wildfire, um, not to other natural hazards at large, only because I manage through Headwater Economics, a program that's funded through USDA, primarily for services, our key partner on this. And it's called the Community Planning Assistance for Wildfire, CPAW is the acronym, but we work with communities on the ground to help, as I've mentioned in, the, in this panel, anticipate and plan for a wildfire. So that's things about evacuation routes, home hardening materials, watershed uh, protection, other critical assets that need to be considered with respect to wildfire and particularly homes and structural level mitigation efforts. The program is free for communities to apply to. They get our consulting expertise for more than a year or multiple years, depending on how long it takes. And we work with them really, really closely to ensure that they actually have some success in long-term resiliency with respect to wildfire. Again, this is a program that's fully supported and funded through the USDA. So they see that this is not an easy one you know, size fits all solution that it does require very tailored and customized responses for community needs. And so this is one, uh, I can drop the link to this program in the chat box. Uh, it's one program I know of because I manage it, but I am sure that there are others out there that are similarly modeled after it. And so, so like Kimmy, I can, I can focus it on water and wastewater. I mean, going back to our case study, Corianne, you know, the importance of the emergency response plan is so critical. And here you've got over 300 technical assistance providers through the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. Um, so we're just like a, you know, a, a fifth of that, um, but they cover the entire country. And so reaching out to them and asking for that support. But I think what we, what we need to do is use that as a building block and then design a much larger community emergency response uh, plan on top of that. Um, and I don't know that, that we're equipped for that yet, that we have sort of an, an easy go-to uh, for that larger uh, community response plan. And I just wanna, uh, for ITEP, um, we, I think in the, in the, to answer that question, we do that through our cohorts where we provide uh, kind of that group support, but also work with them on an individual basis if they need it. So we, I guess in a sense, we do a lot of pre-development and pre-planning, and then we want tribes to kind of run with it after they have those plans um, developed um, and whatnot. And so, um, and we have access and we connect our tribal partners to the technical experts that you mentioned. Um, but yeah, they can be costly, but uh, we're very upfront with that, about that process with them. But yeah, we don't, but other, we don't really hold our hands after, after that, unless they ask us to. But yeah, that's a really good question. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. I would just add two things. I, I think you've heard through um, the examples that Kimmy and Inez shared is that USDA tends to fund um, intermediaries who then help do uh, planning and pre-development work. Um, those are two examples that they shared. Um, I would say the other thing though is while we do work through you know, local partners who can provide that kind of planning and technical assistance work, um, if you don't know if uh, one of those organizations exists to provide you that kind of planning support, I would um, suggest reaching out to one of our USDA Rural Development offices. So we have 400 offices across the country, across the states and territories. Um, and that's the strength of our organization, as I mentioned before, is that we have staff living and working and serving rural communities. And so they tend to, to really have a good understanding of 
local and regional partners who can provide that pre-development and planning and technical assistance work that they can connect you to. Um, so all of our offices are listed on our website. You can just go to usda.gov and, and you can find the, the contact information and phone numbers and reach out to our folks there. And hopefully they can help connect you to some of the organizations who are assisting with that pre-development and planning support. Wonderful, and those links are also available on the events page um, for participants to access there. I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. And Nikki, we had um, a very specific one come in for you that I think would be helpful to um, hear a response to. Mm -hmm. um, this audience member is wondering about um, tribes that have different recognitions and different um, ways of uh, kind of interacting with the US federal government. Um, so we have a question about um, tribes that uh, want to pursue disaster grants that might be available to them, um, but might not meet the economic thresholds that are established uh, to pursue them. Um, and with a follow on question about how do we address the needs of tribes that are not federally recognized? Um, maybe those uh, that don't um, that just have state only recognition. Um, and mm -hmm. then finally, um, a question about those tribes that still follow, you know, more traditional practices and might not want to pursue um, or interact with kind of funding from outside agents. Um, love to just hear your, your perspective on how you've seen different communities, um, uh, tribal communities, um, yeah, in, interface with the resources that may or may not be available to them. I'll speak from my experience in working, uh, holding these sessions, uh, whether it's a workshop, conference session, uh, training, um, that tri federally recognized tribes who host or the host organizations uh, for, for these events often welcome non-federally recognized tribal um, professionals, community members in, into the fold, because we all, rec we all know and recognize that, that they are lacking a lot of the resources and we understand their frustrations. And so, and at ITEP, we do the same thing, especially for my climate change program, we welcome them. Um, we just can't pay for their travel and all that stuff. And often um, they find ways to do that. And there's several nonprofit organizations out there. Um, perhaps um, I'll try and put that in the chat box, but there's like the Lichen, L-I-K-E-N network that works a lot with uh, Louisiana and some of the other South Southeast tribes on uh, relocation, flooding and, uh, and, and other projects. So, and I, so in that respect, um, we, um, they can look to us and we can also provide other organizations that can help. Um, as for the question um, or the statement about tribes still following traditional practices and not wanting funding from outside agencies, I cannot speak to that. That is their choice. That is um, what they want to do. And I, I don't, I, I, I can't comment on that, but except for the fact that that's what they, um, that's what they, that's the, the direction that they want to go into. And uh, Corianne, I think there was that question about economic thresholds established. Um, I, I, I can't comment on that. I don't, I'm not versed in that. So I'll, I'll refrain from answering. So back that to you. That sounds fine. It sounds like your services are available to um, tribal members across the country, kind of regardless of their status, um, that you're a great first stop for them uh, when they're looking for resources. Yeah, I want to mention Which we are mean? federally, yeah, we are federally funded. Um, and our, for, you know, federally recognized tribal members, our staff get first dibs, but then there's always room for anyone. They don't have to be indigenous. They don't have to be working for a tribe. I've had nonprofit federal academic folks in our session, any, any events that we hold. So yes, thank you. Wonderful. And there is a link to your website also on the events page. So folks who want to uh, take advantage of that can look at your offerings. I just want to thank all of our panelists for participating today. Um, Nikki, Farah, Kimmy, Ines, thank you so much for 
Um, just this rich discussion, um, you know, that focused certainly on the frustrations, but also provided some really good examples um, and hopefully a, a path forward uh, to building greater rural and native community resilience to disasters. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'd love to thank everyone for attending. Um, anything you missed, visit the events page. The recording will be posted there soon, um, along with a lot of the great resources discussed today. So thank you so much to everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.